It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of assembling ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 1.1. Galatians 1.1. We're starting a study of Galatians. And first of all, we need to know who are the Galatians. Who are the Galatians? Actually, the Galatians are Irish, cousins of the Irish. And uh, d during those days, before Galatia was founded, there was big hordes that moved west, and they landed in areas like Ireland, England, Great Britain, those areas. And then uh, d the Galatians decided, as a tribe of them, that they would move back to their homeland. So they moved back east. Everyone was moving west, but they decided to move back east. They are a tough people. They're a warrior race, and they're cousins of the Celtics, also cousins of the Irish. They're a hot-tempered people, and they're a hard-headed people, just like the Irish are known today. Hot-tempered and hard-headed. And the only way to deal with hot-tempered and hard-headed people is to lay it on the line, and that's what the Apostle Paul does. Now the Apostle Paul came to the southern part of Galatia. And at this point, Galatia had become a Roman province. There's history behind that, but I won't go into it. And the Apostle Paul visited many different cities in Galatia. That's described in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. Now when Paul first arrived in Galatia, they thought he was a god. At first, they thought he was a god. Then they thought he was an angel. But finally, Paul convinced them that he was just a man and that they could be saved by believing in Christ. So many of the Galatians were convinced to believe in Christ. Now, as soon after Paul left Galatia, Judaizers followed. That is, people who believed that salvation was by faith plus works and that the spiritual life was by faith was by uh, spirituality plus works. And so everywhere Paul went, here were these Judaizers following him. And this is what occurred, and this is why he wrote Galatians. And Galatians has the most forceful and strong statements ever found in the Bible. The Apostle Paul is sarcastic. You would probably say he's rude. He's not rude. He's sarcastic. He's tough with them. Because remember, they have just went away from grace. They're still saved, but they've gone away from grace. They've moved into legalism. So Paul lays it on the line for him, and he's tough. And this is the toughest, uh, this is a tough, the toughest book in the Bible. And he has the most forceful and strong statements in the Bible. And actually, Paul has an all-out assault on legalism. And we will actually see from Galatians how much the Apostle Paul detests legalism. And uh, by inference, how much God detests legalism. Now, Paul wrote Galatians from Corinth. That's because he had heard reports that the Galatians started believing that you had to be circumcised to be saved. So thousands of these Gentiles were being circumcised. And he heard about this, and it about sent him over the edge. But he was still in fellowship, of course, when he wrote Galatians. He was upset, but in fellowship. This is called righteous indignation. Now, it starts off pretty soft. But once we get deeper into Galatians, he gets tough. So we start off with the salutation in Galatians 1.1. From Paul, an apostle, not of men, nor by human agency, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now the word Paul means little. The name Paul means little. And notice he doesn't even give his last name. I don't even know Paul's last name. He just says, I am Paul. And Paul means little. So by way of application, whatever we are, we are by the grace of God. Apostle Paul was the greatest apostle ever, yet his name means little, and he has uh, no qualms about writing 
from little. That's his name. So Paul did not earn or deserve the apostleship. Fact is, none of us deserve anything from God. We don't deserve our spiritual gifts, and we all have at least one. And we receive a spiritual gift or even more than one spiritual gift, and we don't earn it or deserve it, and neither did Paul. Even though the greatest apostle, he did not earn it or deserve it. Now, Paul is an apostle. This means that Paul is an absolute spiritual dictator. And we'll, we will look at this from the Greek. He is an absolute spiritual dictator. And you say, but apostle means one sent. It means the one who was sent to command. It is one sent, but there's more to it. One who was sent to command. And the apostle Paul is the apostle of all apostles. He's the head honcho. Now we need to know what an apostle is and what it all means. From Paul, little, an apostle. What is an apostle? Well, it comes from the Greek word, and we'll look at the etymology of the Greek. It comes from the Greek word apostolos. You know, I'm not even going to write on... Well, here we go. Apostolos. Apostolos. Now, there's no definite article as in uh, Colossians 1.1. And what apostolos means is the high quality of the noun emphasized. And when he says Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ in Colossians 1.1... It is Paul having the highest rank ever given, the spiritual dictator. And he actually had the highest rank ever given to any member of the royal family of God. Now, Paul did carry lots of authority. He carried lots of authority by his birth. He was a Roman citizen, and it meant something back then to be a Roman citizen. That means he had authority in the Middle East, because Rome had taken over the Middle East. So as a Roman citizen, Paul carried authority in the Middle East. As a Pharisee, Paul carried authority over Judea. Paul was a Pharisee and a Roman citizen. That in itself carried authority with it. But now he's given apostleship in the royal family of God, and that is when the Apostle Paul reached the peak of his authority and rank as an apostle, the greatest apostle. So apostolos is an Attic Greek word. And now it was used 500 years before the, Old Test the New Testament was even written. The word apostolos was used even before the New Testament was written. And it was originally used for a high-ranking admiral in the, uh, in the uh, Navy. A high-ranking admiral. And he was the highest commander. He was the highest commander of the Athenian fleet. And usually the Athenians would fight the Spartans and it was the highest rank. So that's what apostle means, highest rank, commander, spiritual dictator. So its third meaning is used less extensively, and that was for a band of Greek colonists. They would go out and colonize. There is a third meaning, and it does have meaning that we'll note later. So the word apostolos connotes responsibility. And both uses of apostolos, whether it's commander of a military naval expedition or the commander heading a Greek colony, it still carried authority. So this word is used in the New Testament epistles in a special way for a temporary spiritual gift. Nobody's an apostle today. People claim it, but they're not apostles whatsoever. Neither is the Pope an apostle. So this word is used in the New Testament, and it, it is the highest of all temporary gifts. Apostleship is the highest of all temporary gifts. Apostle Paul had it, of course. So let's look at the New Testament use of apostolos. Until the canon of Scripture was circulated, starting in 96 A.D., apostleship was a gift of super authority. Apostleship is a gift of super authority, and it goes beyond the local church level. In the local church, you have the authority of pastor-teacher. This goes beyond that. And they did have pastor-teachers of certain local congregations in Galatia. But the Apostle Paul was head of them all. And it was temporary. Now we have stuff like uh, Southern Baptist conventions in which one Baptist is over all the others. It's nonsense. We're not in that age anymore. It's pre-canon. So there were two categories of apostles in the early church. 
and they correspond to the use of the word apostolos. First of all, we have the 12 men with the spiritual gift of apostleship, actually the 11 men, and that was to Israel starting out. Then we have pioneer missionaries as uh, delegated to the function of the early church, and that's analogous to the governor of a Greek colony, so it all connotes authority. So the spiritual gift of apostleship is as follows. The gift of apostleship is the first and highest of all spiritual gifts given. It had maximum authority. It's listed in 1 Corinthians 12:28 and Ephesians 4:11. The apostles had supernumerary powers. That means they had other spiritual gifts along with apostleship. It was a credit card to show their apostleship, such as gift of miracles, tongues, etc. Eleven of these apostles were carried over from being apostles to Israel, and then it was carried over, and that's found in Matthew 10, 2 through 4. Now, Paul was replaced by Judas Iscariot according to 1 Corinthians 15, 7 through 10. Now, Judas Iscariot had the leadership position, but he did not have the gift, as it were. He had leadership position. He was an unbeliever, and we'll note that later on if it's even necessary, but it is noted later on. So we have the formation of the canon of Scripture in the New Testament, and that ended the authority of the apostles. The apostles were the leadership in the pre-canon era of the church age, and that was to fill a deficiency. Now, apostles were not appointed until after the resurrection of Christ. That's found in Ephesians 4.8 in which it says, and he has distributed spiritual gifts to men. Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some apostles. Also 1 Corinthians 12.11 and 28. I'm going over this rather quickly. I'm just letting you know what an apostle is before we move on with this epistle. So until Christ, until Christ's session, there were no apostles. So Judas couldn't have been one. The spiritual gift of apostleship was temporary and it was discontinued after the completion of the work on the cross. Now we have the roster of the spiritual gift of apostleship. And there is a roster to it. First of all, there must be distinction made between the two categories of apostles. There was our Lord's appointment to Israel only. And that was with the eleven disciples. And then we have the 12 apostles appointed for the pre-canon period of the church age. Now the roster of the first 11 men goes as follows. We have first of all Simon, Pe Simon Peter. Simon Peter, he was one of the most active of the apostles. Simon Peter. We have Andrew, his brother. And he was an honorary apostle, but he did little because he lived a short life. We have James and John, and John was the one who lived the longest, therefore was the most active. John lived the longest and was the most active. We don't know how long he lived, but probably up over a hundred or near a hundred. We have Philip, and he also had the gift of evangelism. Philip the apostle also had the gift of evangelism, and he used that extensively. We have Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel. We have Doubting Thomas, an apostle, also called Didymus. And Didymus means twin. And he did very little according to the Bible, very little. Extra biblical sources say he probably went to India and did something there. But he did very little. We have Matthew, the Levi, and he was a writer and an apostle. We have Simon the Canaanite. Simon the Canaanite did the least. We have James, the son of Alphaeus. And he, he seems to disappear immediately. He's mistakenly called James the Lesser, nothing lesser about him. It's just, it's just that we don't know much about him, so they call him the Lesser. James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, died to sin face to face with death. You can't get much less than that. So we have Thaddeus. That's also called, he's also called Jude, and he wrote the book of Jude. Very short book. And these 
these eleven are first mentioned in Matthew 10, 2 through 4 as apostles to Israel. And they were the eleven disciples of our Lord who later became apostles. The twelfth apostle is Paul. But before he was recognized as such, we have a farce that occurs in Acts chapter 1, which we will note in a moment. And that is where Peter wanted to have an election. You do not elect spiritual gifts. Now, you do have elections in churches today as part of, uh, well, the government has to do it that way. You have to follow certain laws, etc., but there's nothing spiritual about it. God elects who has what gift. So the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ gave the spirit first spiritual gifts on the day of Pentecost. And after that, they are sovereignly bestowed by God the Holy Spirit. That means you cannot elect what is sovereignly bestowed. Uh, bestowed upon us by God. Cannot elect it. You cannot elect greatness. God imparts spiritual gift. And remember, the church voted for Matthias. We hear about him once. Never again do we hear about that poor fellow who was an elected apostle, but obviously wasn't. So the twelfth man to become the apostle is Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 through 10 says, Then he appeared to James then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born. He appeared to me also on the Damascus road, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove empty or vain. But I labored, studied, even more than all of the rest. He studied more than all the other eleven. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. And that's humility. And that's the Apostle Paul. Now one of the requirements of the spiritual gift of apostleship was to see the resurrected Christ. Judas did not see the resurrected Christ. Judas Iscariot. So the Apostle Paul did see the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. And that is a requirement. All the apostles saw the resurrected Christ. So Paul saw the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, 3 through 6, and other passages as well. He also appeared again to Paul in Arabia while Paul was studying in Arabia. So Paul saw the resurrected Christ actually on four different occasions. In genuine humility, Paul wrote to Timothy that he was the worst sinner that ever lived, which is true. He was the most religious, therefore the greatest of sinners. The more religious you are, the harder you work for salvation, the more you get into evil. And the worst people on the face of the earth are religious people or legalists. They are the worst of sinners. Not the people who go out and raise hell on Friday and Saturday night. They aren't the worst of sinners. The worst of sinners are legalists. Those who go to church on Sunday morning. Hard to swallow, but very true. And Paul himself said, I was the worst of sinners. As the most religious man in history, the worst of sinners. And as an unbeliever, Paul murdered many Christians. Yet, by grace, he became the greatest of all believers in this church age. That's grace. So Paul became an apostle as a result of the sovereign decision of Jesus Christ. Do you think Peter would have chosen Paul? Peter knew about Saul of Tarsus. Peter knew about how he was going around killing Christians and holding the coats while Christians were being stoned with rocks. And uh, Peter knew all of that. There's no way he would have chosen Paul. No way, but who did? God. God chooses spiritual gifts. If you're not pleased with your spiritual gift or you want one that's a little more flashy, talk to God about it. He bestows spiritual gifts. And he gave it to Paul. We have the office of apostleship, and that is related to pioneer missions. And what apostles would do is, uh, what these apostles would do is kind of like what missionaries do today. They'll go to India, for example, and uh, evangelize them, then find somebody who has the gift of communication that knows their own culture, their own language, and then uh, uh, teach those pastor teachers so that they can have indigenous pastors, people who understand the own cult, their own culture, their own language, and everything else. And I tell you, you need to have this indigenous pastor concept because I learned the word for left in um, 
Telugu, which is what they speak in part of India. It's Ridjbit Anu. And that means left. And you have to say all that to say left. Ridjbit Anu. It's a, in a, it's a very tough language. Therefore, in order to have the concept of pastor teachers, you must have them indigenously in that area to teach. So this is called colonial apostleship, and uh, some of those included Barnabas. Barnabas was a colonial apostle in this sense. Barnabas, also James, a colonial pas uh, uh, apostle. Apollos was one, and um, uh, Silas was another. Timothy, Titus, Epaphroditus, Andronicus, and Junia all were apostles in the sense of being pioneer missionaries. The first missionaries with the gift of apostleship, but they were missionaries and went out all across the Roman world and the whole world and set up churches. James, who is our Lord's half-brother, had the same delegated authority as an apostle. Apollos is an apostle, and Apollos was the first pastor to leave a church. He left the Corinthians. He taught them for a while. He was a great orator. And he got tired of them and said, bye-bye, left them. He said, you're a bunch of carnal people. You don't listen. I'm leaving. Then ten years later, he came back after they got straightened out by Titus. He was the first one that said, I'm through with this. So Titus had the power also to form churches, and he did so in Crete. Now, he had the authority of the apostle, but he did not have the gift. So these men did not really have the spiritual gift of apostleship, but they were the first pioneering missionaries. And in the Bible, they may be called apostles. That just means they had the authority, but they didn't truly have the, the gift of apostleship. They just had authority when they went on their missionary journeys. So we will get a summary of apostleship, a summary of it, and then we'll move on. Apostleship is a unique spiritual gift sovereignly de delegated by our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was a temporary gift. Apostleship is a unique spiritual gift sovereignly delegated by our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, all spiritual gifts are permanent. You may have more than one and they are permanent. God the Holy Spirit gives it to you the moment you believe in Christ. And you have it until the moment you drop dead or are resurrected. All spiritual gifts are permanent and given at the point of salvation by God the Holy Spirit, not by election of men. In the pre-canon period of the church age, certain temporary spiritual gifts were given to carry on with the church until the canon of the New Testament had been completed and circulated. That includes uh, spiritual gifts such as healing. But once the New Testament was completed, all these temporary spiritual gifts were withdrawn. The apostles to the church were not appointed until after the resurrection of Christ. That is, the apostles to the church. You might be confused on that. There's the apostles to Israel, then there's the apostles to the church. The apostles to the church were not appointed until after the resurrection. John was the last of the apostles, and he functioned as a minister at Ephesus. And John lived in the region of the Antonine Caesars. The apostles, as the human authors of the New Testament, prophesied details of the eschatological dispensations. That is, they prophesied things that will occur in the tribulation and in the millennium. So that's the gift of apostleship, and this is the gift the Apostle Paul has. Now turn in your Bibles to Acts 1, 20 through 26. And hold your finger on Galatians 1, 1 as well, because we will uh, use these things in tandem. That's Acts 1, 20. And Acts 1.20 will go along with Galatians 1.1b, so we'll be flipping back and forth. Now Galatians 1.1b says, Not of men, see, uh, Paul an apostle. Not of men, that's plural. I want you to notice that. Not of men, plural, meaning not elected. 
not of men, not elected, nor by human agency. No one in authority over Paul as a man gave him the gift of apostleship. Just as if, uh, if I were to have a son, it doesn't mean he would be a pastor teacher. It's not given in that way. And it's not given by appointment of human agency either. So not of men. He's an apostle, not of men, not by election, nor by any human agency, nor that is, by no powerful man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now this is Paul telling us how he received his gift of apostleship. Now let's look at Acts 1, 20 through 26. Now Peter noticed a problem. Judas Iscariot had died and gone to his own place. And Peter jumped, jumped the gun and said, We need an apostle and we need one now. And this is how it goes. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it and may another take his place of leadership. Not apostleship, leadership. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his, who, Judas Iscariot, place, be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Now this means, as it was written in Psalms, Judas Iscariot went to hell. And then uh, he goes on. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of them, men, who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus Christ went, went in and out among us. Now, this is Peter starting to put stipulation on God, really. Peter's saying, well, we need to have an apostle, but the only way we can have a good apostle is if we limit it to those who are with us and were with Jesus Christ. Being very arrogant, putting a limitation on God is what he's doing. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taking up, taken up from us. More limitations. For one of us must be ordained with us of his resurrection. That means witnesses of the resurrection. He, he's saying we need to ordain somebody and they had to be with us in his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. Lord, you know everyone's heart. That's the correct prayer. He does. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostol apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs, hell. Then they cast lots, votes, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. Poor Matthias. See, he never did it. We don't hear anything about Matthias after this. Here they are going through this very almost uh, religious type ceremony. And here is uh, Peter putting limitations on who could be an apostle. And he, in his arrogance, gets everyone to vote, like in a democracy, on who's going to be an apostle. Stupid. People do it today, too, but it's stupid. God appoints spiritual gifts. Not of men, nor by human agency, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. As I said, if Paul had been standing there, they would, nobody would have voted for Paul. Nobody. Only God voted for Paul, and that's all that matters. And he was given the gift of apostleship. And that's the way it goes with all of us. When we believe in Christ, we receive a spiritual gift might not be the one you want, but you better stick with it. And if you have a problem with it, talk to God about it. He's not going to change it. Now, I guess some people think they need to have the flashy gift. Some people have a desire for certain gifts. Some people want to be a pastor. That's what most people, I think, want to be, men type, want to be a pastor. Well, if you don't have the gift, you don't have the gift. Don't fret over it. You have another gift that you can use. And God's given it to you. So Galatians 1, 2 now. Galatians 1, 2. Galatians 1, 2. There's no gift of Sunday school teacher, by the way. That is for adults. There is for children, but not for adults. No gift of Sunday school teacher to adults. That's the pastor's job. 
Lots of problems come out of that. Galatians 1, 2. And all the brothers with me. And all the brothers with me. Now Paul's starting off a little soft. And he's saying all the brothers, meaning they're all members of the same team. And this is what he's saying. And all the brothers with me. You see, Paul was a great apostle, but he had brothers with him, meaning fellow believers with him. And not one man can't do it all. It takes a team, and it takes teamwork. If everybody wants to be a quarterback on a football team, that football team will fail in every way. Everybody wants to be quarterback, top cheese, the one that gets all the attention. And if everyone is allowed to be quarterback, nothing gets done. The team falls apart. We're a team. And the problem with Christianity today is people don't think of themselves as teams. They think of themselves as competitors. They're competing against each other. The stupidest thing in the world for believers to do is compete with each other. Dumb. So most people are in competition or they're power hungry. Now churches can fail and oftentimes it's not the pastor's fault. It's because there's lack of teamwork. See, a pastor can't do it all. He can't hold the whole church together. It takes a spiritual momentum on the part of the congregation. And if they're not interested in that spiritual momentum, the only thing they'll do is complain and backstab and complain and all of that junk. They're, and when churches fall apart, it's always because there's been a lack of teamwork, lack of prayer, prayer support. And just think about how often you spend in prayer about me or this church. I'm not going to ask you personally, but just think about it. That's part of your teamwork. I spend time in prayer about you. And as part of the team, well, you've got to be together and not in competition and not complaining about this, that, or the other and not complaining about personality. Paul's personality in a moment will not be nice. We won't see it today. We'll see it after a while. Paul is not nice in Galatians. He's not nice to the Galatians. He's tough, very tough. So he says, and all the brothers with me, meaning Paul had a team of believers with him, helping him, praying for him. And in every one of his epistles, he asks for the prayer support. And then he says, to the churches, and all the brothers with me to the churches, that is the local churches scattered throughout the area of Galatia. Local churches had sprung up all across Galatia. Local churches. And that is how it should be. Local churches. Not denominations. Local churches. Local independent churches. Now in this case, the Apostle Paul is the head of all these churches because he's the Apostle. But once the gift of apostleship is withdrawn, the ultimate authority is one pastor teacher per one local church. One pastor teacher per one local church, not two, not assistant pastor. One pastor teacher. You start having assistant pastors and people get confused. This assistant pastor said this, but the real pastor said that, and then the church splits. We'll go with the assistant. He seems nicer. And we'll kick the, big, the, the pastor out who's not so nice, but correct, but not so nice, and go with the assistant guy, all personality ploy. And people in carnality go for personality. People not in carnality but wanting the Word of God go for the Word of God. They don't care about personality. And obviously, Paul didn't care. And we'll note that later. Now in 1 3. 1 3. Grace and soul prosperity. That means tranquility. Grace and soul prosperity, tranquility to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and soul prosperity to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what we have here is grace always preceding soul prosperity or tranquility. The word grace in Galatians uh, one three. The first word is charis, C H A R I S. The word for grace. 
And grace always precedes soul prosperity or tranquility, called in the Greek, irene, E-I-R-E-N-E. So we have grace, charis, preceding, irene, E-I-R-E-N-E. And uh, to put it in simpler terms, first we believe in Christ, then we have peace with God. Grace first, then peace. Grace is offered to us. Believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. You believe it, then comes peace between you and God, reconciliation. So grace precedes soul prosperity, tranquility, and peace. Grace comes before peace. And we have the eternal peace mentioned in Revelation 21.4. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have passed away. We cannot earn or deserve grace. So Apostle Paul starts off in Galatians 1, 3, Grace, Chorus! And this is something the Galatians have ran away from. They've gone AWOL from grace, as we will note later. So first thing he does is throw out a word called grace. And we can't earn or deserve grace or work for it. And grace here is in the dative of advantage, meaning it's of, the, it's of your advantage to have God's grace. It's to your advantage to have God's grace. The ultimate source of peace is actually how it comes out. Grace and soul prosperity to you from the ultimate source of peace. It's God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? God the Father, the author of the plan. Our Lord Jesus Christ executed the plan. God the Holy Spirit, of course, reveals the plan. So that's Galatians 1.3. Now let's look at Galatians 1.4. Who? Jesus Christ. And this, when it says who, there's more to it than that. It's talking about Jesus Christ being the key to the plan, who once and for all gave himself as a substitute. So again, who? Jesus Christ, the key to the plan, who once and for all gave himself as a substitute. You probably have gave himself for, for our sins. It's as a substitute. Who pair? Whoever translated it just left out the Greek word hupair. means as a substitute. As a substitute for our sins. Not for our sins, but as a substitute for our sins. He gave himself as a substitute for our sins to rescue. To pluck out of the burning, as it were. To rescue us out from. Ek plus koilia. Out from. Ek plus koilia. And ek plus koilia is used many times in the Bible, and it means out from. We are, when we are born, it's out from the womb. Ek, ek plus koilia, and it's that way in the Bible. Life begins at birth. Be born again. Spiritual life begins at birth. Physical life begins at birth. Ek plus koilia, out from, is how it goes. So who uh, gave himself as a substitute for our sins to rescue us out from this present evil age. Rescue us out from this present evil age. What is the present evil age? The present evil world stands for the domain of Satan. And we are rescued out from the domain of Satan. According to the will of God our Father. Now, present evil, again, stands for the domain of Satan, and Satan will continue to rule this world until the second advent of Jesus Christ. And there's no hope for this world in a world system. There's no hope for this world in any type of things we try to do to whitewash Satan's world. All other solutions outside of faith alone and Christ alone still leave you in the dark, and you're still hell-bound no matter what type of solution you try to come up for the world's problems. And too many Christians today, instead of witnessing and instead of learning the Word of God, they're trying to whitewash the devil's world. They're holding up signs and posters. And they don't need to be doing that. They need to be witnessing and they need to be learning the Word of God. First learn the Word of God, then you'll know how to witness. They think holding up a sign against abortion or something else is witnessing. That's not witnessing. Nobody's going to get saved from that. It's nonsense, a waste of time. 
So instead of witnessing, they try to whitewash the devil's world. There's always going to be things in this world you don't approve of and you don't like. Always. What are you going to do? Go on a crusade and stop it? Well, you may even succeed in stopping it. But you haven't stopped one person from going to hell. And you yourself are going to go under punishment. It's arrogance trying to whitewash the devil's world. And the devil wants you to get out and do those things. He wants you to. He wants his world to be nice. He's failing in doing so. There's only one way to resolve the world's problem. If you really want to resolve all the world's problems, you've got to kick Satan off the earth. And we can't do that. But if you really wanted to solve all the world's problems, kick Satan off the earth. We can't do it, but Jesus Christ will. And then all the world's problems will be solved. And then we move into the millennium. But then people cause problems for themselves in the Gog and Magog revolution. So what Christians are doing today, they're symptom shadow boxing instead of learning the Word of God. And we are in an evil age, and we will be until the second advent. Everyone will be in an evil age. And the only way to preserve ourselves, and we don't really do it, we are rescued. And the only way we are going to be rescued is, first of all, faith alone in Christ alone. Then if you want to have any spiritual impact, or invisible impact, grow in grace and in knowledge. And that will put nails in Satan's coffin. Now in 1.5. To whom, Jesus Christ, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen means I believe it. To whom be glory forever and ever. The only reason we are here as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is to glorify God. The only reason you breathe is to glorify God. To Him be glory. So what we need to start doing is living our life in the light of eternity, growing in grace and in knowledge. And we must really take heed to these words forever and ever. When we go to heaven, who's going to receive all the glory forever and ever? Jesus Christ, forever and ever. It's doubled there forever and ever to emphasize to you the life that you live on this earth. You may be young right now, but even if you're young now and you live to be a hundred, it's a drop in the bucket. You better live your life in the light of eternity because to Jesus Christ be the glory forever and ever. Then we have I believe it or amen. And amen is actually a challenge to the Galatians. Amen means I believe it. So what Paul is saying is, do you believe it, Galatians? And the answer is no. They don't believe it. They don't believe they're saved by faith alone in Christ alone anymore. They did it once. They don't anymore. And they don't believe to Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. They believe that to them is glory. Because of who and what they are, they're going to heaven. And they glorify the act of circumcision. Because they've uh, cut off their foreskin, they're going to heaven, they think. That's a glorification of self, glorification of energy of the flesh. So amen is a challenge. Do you believe it, Galatians? And if they did believe it, they would run away from the legalist instead of listening to them. And what's happened, that's the end of the salutation. And what has happened is uh, Paul greets them. And he, he doesn't even greet them as nicely as he does with the other epistles. He starts out kind of soft. He's going to get tougher. And we won't get to the tough parts until tomorrow. We won't even get in it until the next hour. And in the next hour, we need to really dig into amen. It might be the first time we've crossed it. Probably not the first time we've crossed the word. But we need to know what amen's all about. People confuse it. They don't know what it means. They think it's a ritual to shout during church and to get brownie points. Amen has meaning. It's not just a word. It has meaning. And the reason why it's in the Bible, there's a reason for it. And we will note amen. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.